Can you believe we are on week eight today? We're starting Ephesians chapter four, and we're going to be talking about how to walk. A basic truth about the Christian life is that we have to learn how to walk. When you were born into this world, you didn't come out of the womb walking. After some months, you had to learn how to crawl. Then you learned how to get to your feet and you wobbled and stumbled and then you got back up. Then you walked a little and wobbled some more until you could move along. When you became a believer, you became a babe again. You were created anew in Christ, born again, and everything has changed. You have to learn how to walk again. And even if you've been in Christ for a while, sometimes we forget how we're supposed to walk in certain areas and we have to return to the basics and learn again. The Bible talks a lot about how we walk, which is simply how we live, how we think, how we behave. Now Ephesians 2 told us how we walked before. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, he made us alive in Christ Jesus. And he has given us grace to walk in a whole new way. So in chapters one through three of Ephesians, Paul built us up, didn't he? He built us up in who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. And now he's saying, take all of that grace, all those blessings, all that power, and this is what I want you to do with it. I want you to walk with humility. I want you to take the low seat. This is how chapter four begins. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So notice as Paul turns to the practical side of our Christian life, the first thing he comes out the gate with is what our heart attitude should be, what's central to who we are in Christ, and that is humility. Humility actually comes from Greek words that mean lowliness of mind, esteeming ourselves small. It's the correct measure of ourselves. In comparison to whom? God for one, which is why God says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. We view God and we see his awesomeness, his bigness. He is infinite eternal. We can't overstate his magnificence. We, on the other hand, are small. Yet, because of the ways of this world and the ways of the enemy, there's always this temptation lurking to over-esteem ourselves, to think more of ourselves than we ought. Pride is one of the greatest sins. It's ugly. It's sneaky. It shows up in a million different forms and it's always opposed to God. And that's no surprise because the God of this world, Satan, specializes in pride. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Satan wanted to be like God and then he turned around and tempted Eve with the same thing when he told her that if she would eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. And pride has been an issue in the hearts of mankind ever since. There was only one person who could have justifiably exalted himself and didn't, 
and that was Jesus. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. It's talking about Jesus and it says, Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now look back up in that same chapter, Philippians 2, at the first verses of that chapter. They go hand in hand with our Ephesians verses. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, which we just read. So in that lowliness of mind that I talked about earlier, it's telling us that in Philippians as well, that we are to regard others as more important than ourselves. And if our Lord can humble himself, who was God, how much more should we by God's grace look to have a walk of humility? First Peter 5, 5 says, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So how do we keep a humble heart? We keep our focus on Christ, keeping in mind that he was God, yet emptied himself, humbled himself, and went to the cross on our behalf. So who are we to think more of ourselves than we are? We keep a proper focus on who we are, we have to remember that we were sinful, dead people. And if it wasn't for God's grace, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins. Everything God has given us and done for us was for his glory. We can keep a humble heart by daily confessing sin. When we have a proper view of ourselves and the sin nature that still resides in us, it's hard to think more of ourselves than we ought. We should ask God to check our motives. Pride is sneaky and the heart is deceptive above all else. And we should ask God to show us the pride that's in our heart and to strip us of it. Ask him to continually cultivate humility in your heart. Once you're focused on a walk of humility, the other godly attitudes in this list in Ephesians 4 will follow. Gentleness. And another word for gentleness is meekness. It means to be mild-spirited, self-controlled. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Gentleness or meekness doesn't mean weakness necessarily, but it's strength under control. I thought this was interesting that the Greek word that gentleness or meekness comes from, it was used for wild animals that had been tamed. So if you tame a lion, the lion is still powerful, but its will is under control. In our case, we were under the control of the enemy before. Now we want to place ourselves under the control of the Holy Spirit. Patience is the third attitude that we're to have in this walk. It means long suffering, self restraint before proceeding to action. Patience is just a part of this walk. 
God cultivates it in us whether we like it or not. We are always waiting on God in one way or another. And we will endure trials and afflictions in one way or another. Patience is what helps us wait and endure with contentment instead of complaining or being stressed. We're trusting that God is working all things together for good for us. We're trusting in his timing and we're trusting that he's developing godly character in us in the midst. And then it says in Ephesians 4, still in verse 2, showing tolerance for one another in love. It also means bearing with one another in love. I kind of think of this attitude as patience on steroids, patience to the max. Because as hard as it might be to have patience with God, it's even harder to have patience with people. With God, we may not understand everything, but we know he's perfect. We know he's got it. Deep down, we know we can trust him. He can take all the chaos in our life and work it out. He's able to do that. But people, we're messy. We're sinful. We're supposed to bear with the people who created the chaos in our lives. But see how it says we're to do this in love? That's our walk. Unconditional love that's only possible through the Holy Spirit. The kind of love that covers a multitude of sins, that doesn't hold people's sins against them. The kind of love that forgives. You can see how humility helps us with all of this because if we're aware of our own sinfulness, it helps us to be more forgiving of others when they sin. And all of this leads to verse three, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's all about body life, the body of Christ, preferring others, considering others more important than ourselves so that we can walk as one and serve as a witness to a dying world. Paul tells us that's where the worthy walk begins. Now let's move to verses four through six. It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So we see this emphasis on that word one, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Then he moves to our importance as members in this body, starting with verse seven. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. So we're one body and within the body, each of us is given a grace gift. I want to look at a similar passage in Romans 12 that has this theme of humility and the body and gifts. Starting at 12, three in Romans, it says, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. So I love that each of us 
in the body of Christ has been given a gift by the grace of God. And they're all different. There's no limit to the way God can measure out and shape his grace in the form of a gift to each one of us. And that gift is given to us in order to bless others. I want to stay on this a minute because we know how the enemy works. He wants some to feel that they're useless in the body, that they don't have anything to offer, or he will tempt people to jealousy and envy over gifts that God has given to others, or he will tempt people to pride, thinking that their gifts are more important or more useful than others in the body. But I love this in 1 Corinthians 12, and I want to read it because I think it's so important. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a member of the body. And if you are a member of the body, you have a spiritual gift, probably more than one. You are an indispensable part of the body. The body cannot function fully without you. Know your worth in Christ. Let's move down to verse 11 where Paul begins to talk more about this body and how it functions. He says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ as a result we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. I wanted to read all of that at once so we could see the focus on that key word, the body. 
It's all about the building up of the body and knowing how we're to function as individual members of the body and how that whole body and all the members are being fitted together. It's just a beautiful picture of oneness in Christ. Notice the goal, maturity in the faith. Did you see the contrast between being children and growing up? That's the plan for believers, that we would continually be growing in the faith. And verse 11 says, God gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip us. For what? For the work of service. And again, the goal is that we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We cannot grow to maturity apart from the knowledge of Christ and His Word. Apart from a knowledge of Christ and His Word, we will be like children, tossed to and fro. And I love the speaking the truth in love part. We don't want to be big on speaking truth, but have no love. But at the same time, we don't want to be big on love yet afraid to speak truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. When we speak the truth to one another in love, we're helping each other to grow. God has made the body in such a way that we are individually members of one another. And in order for us to grow, each of us has to be a properly working part. Each of us needs to be equipped. Each of us needs to be doing the work of service. And oftentimes that important work begins right in the home. In a spiritual sense, we are no longer living as individuals. We are joined together, fitted together. We are part of one another. And each of us has a part to play. As we walk in humility and gentleness and patience and forbear with one another, let us walk worthy of our calling for the glory of the head of this body, Jesus Christ.